Uh, the next case is Turner versus Farmers and Enterprise. Um, Mr. Wiener, Mr. Kamenek, um, you each have 20 minutes in this case, um, and you may begin. Thank you, Your Honors. Um, I'm assuming you can hear me. We can. Thank you. Um, may it please the court, my name is Robert Kamenek. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, uh, Louis Ronane. We represent the enterprise entities, and throughout the argument, I'll just refer to them as enterprise. Um, Your Honor, I'd like to reserve uh, five minutes for rebuttal, please. You can do your best. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that's a warning. Um, and uh, in terms of the no fire zone, the court can start asking questions at any point. Um, there's a single issue in this case, and that involves whether or not a priority provision of the No Fault Act in and of itself can create an obligation upon an insurer, or in this case, an entity that holds a certificate of self-insurance, when in fact, there's no other provision of the No Fault Act that requires uh, security to be posted for the particular vehicle involved in the case. Um, as the court knows, both the lower courts agreed with enterprise position that the priority provision standing in and of itself could not create a security obligation and therefore, even if Enterprise satisfied the terms of the priority, i.e. came in first in priority, there was still no obligation to provide a PIP benefits. Michigan Court of Appeals reversed in these consolidated cases. This court granted leave to appeal on the solitary question. So foundationally, um, I don't think the parties disagree on the fact that under MCL uh, 500.3101, uh, there's no security obligation. There, uh, there is some debate, which I'll get to in a moment, about whether or not there is a security obligation under the 30-day provision of a 3102. But um, I'll get to that as we move forward. The long and short of the argument is uh, as follows, and I introduced it. Um, when you look at a priority provision, it is only applicable when you have two entities, which in the first instance have a security obligation there's otherwise, there's no requirement, there's no need, there's no logic to compare and determine a ranking of priority if in the first place, one of the entities here, Enterprise, doesn't have a security obligation in the first place. Um, this court has so acknowledged in the Parks case rendered a while ago. Uh, I know that uh, pharmacists tried to distinguish that case, uh, but at, at the end of the day, uh, a panel of a strike that this court back then found that um, in such situations, the court is to look at the more complete requirement that <clears throat> when you're looking at a security question and looking at a priority question, you have to see if there's security in the first place. And that's footnote two in the park's opinion. Um, in many ways, and uh, Your Honor, that's why I saved some time for rebuttal. That is the sum and substance of our argument. It, I was talking to Mr. Rowane earlier today and said, in essence, and if you excuse my French, this is basically a rifle shot type appeal. I mean, that is the proposition that's out there. And if, <clears throat> if, the, if the court accepts it, uh, then, then enterprise cannot be liable on either one of these cases. But candidly, if the court doesn't accept it, uh, then what happens is uh, at least enterprise goes into the priority provisions and we, we take it from there. Um, there's a lot in the brief about why it's important to decide this case. The, as the court well knows, the new law amended the particular priority provision that's at, in, at play here, and the particular priorities that are involved in this case no longer exist. Uh, they do exist, however, with respect to an incident involving a motorcycle. Mr. Kamenek, I'll, I'll uh, take you up on interrupting you and see what questions folks have. Um, Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah, you bet. I'll start with Justice Zara. Well, thank you. Um, I don't think e either party here is asking us to uh, overrule Parks, but but I'm a little bit concerned. Parks expressly stated that it would read uh, the words motor vehicle and the words owner or registrant of a motor vehicle occupied uh, into former section 3114-4A. Uh, as meaning generally motor vehicle required to be registered in this state. Um, doesn't, doesn't parks in that way add words 
to section 3114 that simply aren't there? And should we be concerned about that? I'm not, you should be concerned about it if you have to go that far. And I don't think you have to. I think that the, the overall holding of parks and the overall proposition of law that this court can use is very simply that the more complete requirement for um, deciding whether or not an insurer is liable vis-a-vis -a, -vis a priority provision is that there has to be an independent security obligation, whether it be under something such as section 3111 or here are the two provisions that are inapplicable, 3101 or 3102. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Justice Viviano? <clears throat> no questions, thank you. Justice Bernstein? Counsel, good morning, and again, thank you for joining us. What would the implications be on actual individuals or people if the court were to overturn the Court of Appeals? What would, what would ultimately happen? How would things change? Well, let me answer that in two parts because the statute has changed. I'm gonna read a little bit, if I may, Your Honor, into your question. Please. So under, the, under this case in particular, there would still be a source of payment and that would be farmers because the debate is which one pays. So with respect to the actual claimant here, there would still be security paid in the form of PIP benefits. Um, with respect to the new statute, if you were to graph these facts onto the new statute, then, um, then what happens is the assigned claim steps in and nonetheless, there would still be payment being made to the claimant. So one way or the other, the claimant is insulated uh, from this particular decision. And I, I might add, because it was addressed by farmers in the brief, I want to make clear to the court that even though Enterprise, and it's technically EA and Holdings LLC is the owner, called Enterprise, um, they, are, they do have a certificate of self-insurance. And I think the court knows, but if not, it's a reminder that those entities also pay into the fund. So this is not a situation which has been somewhat colored by farmers' brief to say that Enterprise is basically you know, out of the picture, hasn't followed its responsibilities or the like. It does pay into that fund, um, even though it doesn't participate as an insurer under the plan. In summary, the claimant gets paid. And counsel, just, this is just an education for me because I've, I've just been trying to understand how it works, mainly because I don't drive, so I don't, I've never rented a car before. But I want to just present the hypothetical, and I think you can just help me to confirm this. If an individual has a license but doesn't have insurance and rents a car, what would happen if they had an accident under this, this circumstance? Uh, Your Honor, I believe that MCL 500.3113 would kick in, a separate statute that's not in play in this particular case. And that under the parameters of that statute, I don't have all the details for you, for your hypothetical, there's a case to be made that that person driving without the license may not um, have- No, no, they would have, no, no, they have, they, they, they have a license. Let's say they come in from out of state, they have a license, but they don't have insurance and they rent a car. First off, are they required, this is just something, I'm just asking for, for my own knowledge, I'm just trying to learn. Are they, does Enterprise require them to get insurance upon running a car? Hypothetically, you have a driver's license, but you don't own a vehicle. Let's say you live in New York, you don't drive, you come to Michigan, you rent an Enterprise car, you have a valid driver's license, but you don't have insurance. What happens in that situation? Are, they, are people required to get insurance through Enterprise? How, how does the company kind of deal with people who are licensed but are uninsured? Um, Enterprise does not, under the existing law, have an obligation under a negligent entrustment theory, different issue that's involved here. Right, of course. To inquire to that extent, and there's a lot of, there's, a, there's quite a lot of uh, cases out there, Your Honor, on that particular point. Enterprise does give the option, though, to answer, perhaps to answer your question in part, um, does give the option of uh, checking off the boxes and paying for insurance through, uh, through Enterprise. And if when, when you do rent a vehicle, you, 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 you or me or other, the other justices may know, they usually ask those questions. In most right. instances, um, people say that my present insurance covers the situation. 
So under the order of priority, again, I, I know I'm, I'm taking you off a little bit, but it's just very helpful for me since I don't drive. Um, the, the question I have is under the order of priority, a person comes in, they rent a vehicle from Enterprise, they don't take the insurance from Enterprise, they have an accident, then what would happen if we were to overturn the Court of Appeals? Well, again, if they didn't have insurance at all and they opted out of insurance, Correct. And then the note, the provision that I mentioned earlier, 3113, independent yeah. of anything to do with the priorities. Right, 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 right. Okay. And I, again, I'm, I'm trying to make that, that would probably be the first step in the, uh, in say an enterprises uh, sequence of events in terms of whether or not. I see, I see. Like, um, and so you, the odds are you wouldn't even reach that question. Right. But I understand. Nonetheless, here, if the vehicle, if there was no obligation, Your Honor, uh, that um, the vehicle be registered in Michigan, right? and if the vehicle was not used in Michigan for over 30 days in any one calendar year, right. there would be no obligation to provide security, regardless of whether hypothetically, if you applied the priority provisions, that enterprise would come in first. Thank you, for, counsel. Thank you. You helped to educate me. This is what happens when you have a blind judge who doesn't drive. We we have to get we. I, I have to. I, I I appreciate you educating me more on this on this and how it would affect people. Thank you, Your Honor. Comment? Thank you. No questions. Thank you, J Justice Kavanaugh. None for me. Thank you, Justice Markman. Well, yeah, I, I've got a question, um, Mr. Kamenek. I guess I'd like to follow up on. Uh, Justice Bernstein's questioning and perhaps, if possible, elicit a slightly larger picture of the consequences and the stakes of this case from you, if I might do that. Um, I understand that the claimant would get paid under each of the viable alternatives here, and I understand that there's some consequences for the order of priority, and I certainly understand there's some specific impact for enterprise and the other parties, but um, is there some larger stakes in this case concerning the insurance law of Michigan? Are there some potentially adverse consequences to that law, uh, apart from the fact that enterprise does or doesn't prevail? Um, I mean, you've brought this appeal. You, you obviously feel that there, and we've granted the appeal, and there's, there's some sense that there's some consequences for the development of law in our state. And I guess I'd just like to ask you if you're able to make it more clear, what's been made wrong in the insurance law of our state uh, by the Court of Appeals and what would be the lasting, uh, presumably adverse impact of its decision if we were to allow it to be sustained from your perspective? Thank you, Justice. Um, the long term and the overriding concern here is that when there is a priority provision and it does not provide a grant or requirement of security, it standing alone cannot create an obligation to pay PIP benefits. How it would apply here is that if you go into different provisions of the act, and I'm, I'm reading into a little bit here, and somebody is trying to make a claim that there's an obligation to pay, it has to be found somewhere in the act and it has to apply the particular instance. So we have the incident, the instant, instance, excuse me, of 500.3111. If you were to graft the facts on in here, there's no obligation under 3101, there's no obligation under 3102, but there's an independent security obligation under 3111, and that would be a different story. So I guess the overriding concern would be that you read priority provisions for what they are. They only kick in after the fact when both entities are at play, when both entities have a security obligation. In terms of the law generally, um, this court, as you know from the briefing that, that we have provided, there's all sorts of situations in Michigan law involving priorities, primarily in creditors' rights. And perhaps there would be a ruling in this particular case that would affect that. But I would suggest that the proposed holding here would be that there's under the No Fault Act, there's no obligation to provide PIP benefits unless they arise independently, either under a priority provision, which doesn't apply here, or under 3101 and 3102. I'm not sure I answered your question. That's the best I've got. 
Well, I don't intend to demean in any way the importance of the priority rights. It's important not only for the um, companies involved here, but it's important for the integrity of our law. But uh, I'm understanding you to say that that really is what's central to this case. Uh, yes, Your Honor, I believe that. And I do think uh, it's interesting to follow up a little bit on that, and then I'll stop. Plus, uh, there's more questions. I think it's interesting. When I get this case in the Court of Appeals, I just went through my outline. And one of the things I had suggested to farmers, uh, and I had suggested to the Court of Appeals panel, is if you don't like the way the statute's written, go to the legislature and change it. And lo and behold, and I'm sure it wasn't because of me, but lo and behold, the legislature did change it. So the fact of the matter is the legislature has built the act in a certain fashion as evidenced by its recent amendments that make clear that it decides who's in a priority provision and not, and it decides whether or not there's an overriding security interest, which is the most complete requirement under the parks case that you have to go to first. Thank you, counsel. Uh, I presume you'd like to save the rest of your time for rebuttal. Is that fair, Mr. Kamenek? It is, and hopefully I won't use all of it, Your Honor. Okay, Mr. Wiener. Good morning, uh, Madam Chief Justice. May it please the court. Uh, my name is Jordan Weiner. I represent Farmers Insurance Exchange. Um, I have uh, two points before uh, we open it up to questions. And my first point, um, I think, addresses in whole the question that the court asked us to answer. Um, and that's assuming that enterprise is a non-resident and that these vehicles are not subject to the insurance mandate enterprise is still in the order of priority. And the second point that I want to make would be that um, these vehicles are subject to the insurance mandate. So with regards to the first point, when enterprise elected to self-insure under former MCL 531.01 subsection 4, it has all the obligations and rights as any insurer in Michigan that writes PIP coverage. So then we look to the rest of the No Fault Act to see what are those obligations and what are those rights. And one of those obligations is when a non-resident um, operates or uses a vehicle in Michigan, their insurer agrees to pay PIP benefits. And that's exactly what we have here. So when Mr. Kamenek said that we kind of disagree that there is um, some insurance requirement, uh, they've already agreed to pay uh, the PIP benefits in this case because assuming that Enterprise is a non-resident uh, in a combination of 3101 subsection 4 and a combination of former uh, 3163 subsection 1, we have a non-resident owner, Enterprise, an accident in this state, and accidental bodily injury arising out of the ownership and use of that non-residence vehicle in this state. The statute directs that enterprise is in the order of priority, and that's what, that's what enterprise contemplated according to the statute when it elected to self-insure. Um, so then, what does, does, the next question is, does the insurance actually extend to these occupants? And to that, I say that um, not only is 3114 a priority statute and, along with 3115, um, but it has a dual role and it helps define who an insurance company or in this case an insure, a self-insurer must insure. And that includes occupants of any vehicle owned by the named insured. And it, to illustrate this, if a policy excluded coverage to such an occupant, under the Cruz standard, Cruz versus State Farm, and under the, and the which was just modified or, or relied on recently by this court in Mimic versus Fortson, expressly excluding that class of insureds from a policy, the unenforceable in an insurance policy, and that's effectively what Enterprise is trying to do when it agreed to um, bound by all the obligations of a no fault insurer when it's self insured. So that places enterprise in the order of priority. And because enterprise is in the order of priority um, under 3114-4A, uh, it owes benefits, it's the responsible insurer. And then it also must reimburse farmers as the assigned claim servicing insurer under uh, MCL 531-75. So then 
to my second point, Enterprise says that there is no obligation to um, insure the vehicle, which is tied to the registration requirement. And it looks to two very um, specific exclusions of the Motor Vehicle Code. One, it says that the vehicles were properly registered in its home state. Um, so that's MCL 257-243, subsection 1. Well, the facts that we have here are the vehicles that were at issue are registered in Maryland and uh, Pennsylvania. And presumably that enterprise contends that they are properly registered and enterprise resides in those states for its business operations in those states. And if that's the case, then enterprise is no less a resident of Michigan than it is of um, Maryland and Pennsylvania. But in their reply brief, um, enterprise contends that it only resides in Delaware and Missouri. Delaware, its state of organization, and Missouri, its principal place of business. So it's either, Enterprise is either a Michigan resident, just the same as it is a Maryland and Pennsylvania resident, and it doesn't get the non-resident exception, or it didn't comply with the non-resident exception because the vehicles are not registered in its home state. So we don't get the non-resident exception there. The other non-resident exception that Enterprise looks to is the pleasure vehicle exception that says non-residents don't have to register a vehicle in Mich a pleasure vehicle in Michigan uh, if it's not in Michigan for more than 90 days. Um, but these are not pleasure vehicles. These are business vehicles. Uh, enterprise Roger, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you and see what questions my colleagues have, and we'll get back to you if, it does, if they don't eat up all your time. Uh, Justice Zara? You're muted, Justice Zara. Thank you for that. Um, Council, as I understand Enterprise's argument, they would like us to utilize the canon of in pari materiae uh, to read section 3114.4a in conjunction with 31011 and 31021 such that 3114.4a would read the insurer of the, of the owner of the vehicle occupied and required to be registered in the state is responsible for paying PIP benefits to the insured occupant. What's the flaw with this argument? I think the flaw with that argument is that it creates a requirement in the priority statute that's not there, and it's inconsistent with a number of other sections of the No Fault Act that extend benefits by operation of statute uh, irrespective of the insurance mandate. And specifically, another section of 3163, um, foreign insurers can elect to provide PIP benefits to their foreign insureds if they're in Michigan. So presumably, those vehicles have no registration requirement, which would then not trigger an insurance requirement under 3101. So by, by the nature of the statute itself, the statute uh, doesn't necessarily look to the insurance mandate and equate that as a condition precedent to benefits in general, under, at least in terms for otherwise uninsured occupants. I mean, there are sections of the No Fault Act that looks to the insurance mandate as a condition precedent to benefits, but that's for owners and registrants. And then there's a statutory um, exclusion under MCL 531.13b. So there's, the, and I guess if there, if that was the case, there would be something in 3113 that also recognizes that. Enterprise suggests though that if we don't read it this way, 31011 and 31021 are rendered negatory and without meaning. Is that accurate? Well, I don't think so. I mean, 31011 is the insurance mandate and, and that's the whole basis for um, the, the no fault system, which is it can't be voluntary if we're going to abolish the tort liability. Everybody that operates vehicles on Michigan roads are supposed to insure their vehicles, uh, and that, that was the big bargain. Uh, no more tort liability, but even if you are an at-fault tort feeser, you still get certain economic loss compensated. So it, it doesn't read the insurance mandate out of the statute. Thank you. Justice Viviano? Uh, thank you, Council. I have no questions. Justice Bernstein? 
Also, good morning, and, and again, thank you for joining us. I, I just like to try to understand when I look at these cases, kind of the big picture component to it. Why is this, you know, and I'm just going to ask, I think what's going to be a simple question, but I would really like to kind of get a sense from you. Why is this jurisprudentially significant? What would happen if the Court of Appeals opinion were allowed to stand? What, why it were not allowed to stand? What, what is the significance of this? Why is this important? I, um, with the change in the statute, I don't think it is as nearly significant as it would have been on July or June 10th, 2019. Um, so the scenario where this would really only continue going forward would be if there is a motorcycle accident with a self-insured vehicle. It, it really it would the narrow circumstance that we even have here is a non-resident or potential non-resident self-insured vehicle. Uh, and I just looked at the, uh, the non-resident certification, about a page long, so I'd say maybe like 30 or 40 uh, self-insured entities that are certified in Michigan, and about a half a dozen are non-residents. Uh, two of them, I think, are Wisconsin Utilities. You have Enterprise, Hertz, um, mm -hmm. and, and some other uh, corporations, AT&T maybe. Um, so it's not a real big class of potential insureds that are out there uh, with a non-resident um, self-insured. So jurisprudentially speaking, moving forward, I don't think, it, I don't think it's as important as it was um, before the change in the statute. Um, with regards to cases that are still in the pipeline, I think it affects every single case um, under 3114-4A. If this court says that the insurer of the owner means the insurer of the owner of the vehicle, so long as that vehicle is subject to the insurance mandate, then um, any there, there's priority disputes in countless cases where we're looking to any vehicle that is owned by the uh, or insurer of any other vehicle that's owned by the owner of the vehicle that's involved in the accident, even if that's not the vehicle involved in the accident. Um, so that so that's significant, and that would that would um, exclude uh, any number of insurers, and then shift the burden to the assigned claim system. I see. Thank you, counsel. Um, Justice Clement. No questions. Thank you, Justice Kavanaugh. Justice Markman. No, thank you. Um, do you have any final comments, Mr. Weiner? I, I do, Your Honor. I just have one last comment. Um, and to the extent that 3102 would trigger a similar insurance requirement under 3101, which um, the statute, in, and I think that we focus on the actual use of the vehicle in Michigan, but the statute also talks about permission to use the vehicle in, Mich in Michigan. And uh, the MAIPF's amicus brief goes through this very nicely, I think. So uh, there is nothing in Enterprise's lease agreement that prevents any vehicle from being operated in Michigan. So to the extent that any enterprise, that anybody, um, that these vehicles are permitted to be operated in Michigan, it's 365 days a year. So under 3102, they are required to be insured in Michigan. It might not be, they might not trigger the, the, the registration requirement, but, but I think that we still do trigger the registration requirement based on the residency issues that I raised previously. But even under 3102, because these vehicles are not precluded from being operated in Michigan, 3102 also uh, requires insurance. Thank you, counsel. Are there any more questions based on that? Can I ask I a question? Yes, please, Justice Martin. Um, Mr. Weiner, um, can I ask just one, one follow-up question? Um, when an insurer is not part of the uh, security mandate, um, isn't there just generally some sense of a lesser expectation of insurance liability in some regard, some sense that they have a legitimate expectation that they're going to be treated in a somewhat distinctive manner from those insurers who do fit within the mandate. Is that, uh, 
is that sense implicated in this case at all in your judgment? That disparate, uh, that disparate sense of um, how appropriate is how appropriate it is that an insurer should or shouldn't uh, be covered by the no fault uh, act in all of its particulars. So, if I understand your your question correctly, Justice Markman, so we have in Michigan insurers who are authorized to transact. Uh, Michigan PIP insurance, and then there are foreign insurers who can elect to do so. And I think that the statute says that um, if a foreign insurer elects to provide PIP coverage to its insureds if they are injured in Michigan, they are um, entitled to all of the rights and obligations of a Michigan PIP insurer. So they, they by electing to do that voluntarily, um, they subject themselves to the entire no-fault system. And I think that's also one of the other issues with saying that 3114-4A is subject to whether or not the vehicle itself is subject to the insurance mandate because it completely forecloses the ability of someone to voluntarily provide PIP benefits even though they don't have to. Thank you, Council. Any additional questions for Mr. Weiner? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kamenek, rebuttal. Your Honor, I just have a couple points. Um, Mr. Weiner indicated that because enterprise is self-insured, that it basically should be subject to the priority provisions. And he referenced specifically MCL 503-104, 3101-4. It skips a step. Simple fact that you have a certificate of self-insurance doesn't mean automatically that you provide insurance under every situation under the code. And he, he is missing and Farmers is missing that step. Um, Enterprise has manifested its intent to comply with the law in these circumstances. And all you have to do is look at 3102. If the vehicle is here more than 30 days, then the security requirement kicks in. And um, I, you know, so the whole notion that simply because it has a certificate of self-insurance, you automatically go to the priority provisions just doesn't hold true in my view. And finally, um, what's in, I, I wanna go back to Justice Markman's question and I think it came up with Justice Bernstein and his question to Mr. Weiner. You know, yes, there are gonna be fewer situations where the holding of this case applies simply because the law has changed. But the overriding consideration is still vitally important because what the Court of Appeals did is it basically took a priority provision and through an erroneous ruling of law, it embedded in it a security obligation that doesn't exist in the four corners of that priority provision. And that is the overriding principle here. And so I'm going to suggest that the Court of Appeals opinion for that reason alone needs to be reversed and vacated. And I ask the court to rule in our favor in both cases. Thank you, Mr. Kamenek. The case will be submitted.